Welcome to The Drive Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Atia. If you like this video, please let me know by subscribing to the channel or visiting my website to become a member for more exclusive content. Yeah, it is kind of the silver lining in all of this. Sometimes it's easy if you think about this stuff too much philosophically to lament the fact that we even have ApoB, right? Because there's no real need for ApoB. You know, we, we, could, we could survive with no circulating ApoB and we wouldn't have any atherosclerotic disease. So every time you get a little depressed and have that thought, you can also realize how fortunate are we that the biology of ApoB is so much more well understood than that of ApoA. Now I'm talking ApoBig A. And that eradicating ApoB is becoming easier and easier and easier and safer and safer and safer. And it's the single most important thing that you can do in the plasma to reduce the risk of atherosclerotic disease. I mean, all of these things make for a very fortunate turn of events for our species. And that's why turning to this pesky LP little a is so important because of what you described at the outset, which is this residual risk in the individuals. And it's interesting, you, you talked about 20%. That's higher than I, that's, that's higher than the number I quote my patients. I usually tell my patients it's 10%. So I've been understating this for some time. Um, I didn't realize it. So all comers, 20% of the population would be over 50 milligrams per deciliter. Yeah, depending on on ethnicity, yeah, so yeah. It, it's certainly above fifteen percent. No, no, no wow. doubt about it. And in some population, especially in populations of of European ancestry, they have the highest uh, LPA level. I'm sorry, um, of African ancestry, yeah. they have the uh, highest LPA levels, and they also have the highest LPA levels adjusted for uh, LPA isoform size as well. So uh, in most of indiv individuals, well, in, if you look at the distribution of LPA in the population, it's really skewed towards the null. So it means that there's a lot of patients, most individuals have very low levels of, of LPA. And uh, there's some individuals, as we, as we mentioned, 15 to 20% that have high LPA levels. Now in individuals of African ancestry, it's a, it's a more like a Gaussian uh, distribution. So, um, so that's one of the reasons wow. why they have higher LPA. Does that mean they have higher risk if they have uh, higher LPA? Not necessarily because the, the risk is really proportionate uh, to, to, the, to the level. So there's nobody within shouting distance of the of, of what I'm about to say, I believe, which is LP little a is hands down the most common hereditary driver of ASCVD, correct? I mean, FH wouldn't even get within the same zip code when you think about genetic things that are driving uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, correct? It is by far the most prevalent form of dyslipidemia. So you can argue that maybe it's, and, and we have to talk about penetrance as well. So the, the penetrance is the proportion of individuals with a certain genotype that will have the, phenotype, the disease. Yeah. Exactly. So the penetrance is obviously not 100%, right? Uh, so, so when I hear people say that, you know, LPA for the pharmaceutical industry is a market of 1.4 billion people, I say, well, Hold on a second. It's not it's not everyone that has a high LPA that will have an event, and we need to figure out uh, what are the the drivers of of risk in patients with with high LPA. And we're starting to study that, and we see uh, that uh, there, there is some uh, residual risk effect even in patients with with high LPA. So we see that, for instance, uh, if you have a high LPA but have lower CRP levels or lower like inflammation, you might be, you might not have a, a risk that's as high as if you have high CRP. Uh, so you can argue that residual inflammation is very important, but there need to be more studies on this because one can make the case that while well, it might be the same for smoking or type 2 diabetes or any other cardiovascular risk factor that you can think of. But even then, even if uh, LPA is not fully penetrant, it is so common that uh, it is by far the most uh, important form of dyslipidemia that will uh, explain a lot of cardiovascular events at the population level. And what I find so tragic about that statement is the number of good physicians out there, really great doctors that are working hard, taking care of patients, frontline physicians, family medicine physicians, internists, 
who have no idea what it is. You know, you ask them about it and they look at you as though you've asked them something in a different language. Um, I still struggle to understand that disconnect given its urgency. I, I wonder if that's a uniquely American phenomenon. Do you have any insight? I know you're not a clinician, but do you have an insight as to whether or not the literacy around this in Canada and Europe is higher? I don't have any reasons to believe that the literacy in Canada or Europe is higher than it is in, uh, in America. Even, with, that's one even of the... with your guidelines being more forward leaning. Oh yeah, but these guidelines are new and it will take a lot of time before they implement it. Sometimes it's, you know, it, it takes a, a full decade before it, you know, it's transmitted to younger generation yeah. of physician and, it's, and people actually talk about it. So that's one of the reasons I'm so glad that we get to do this, this podcast. Hopefully this, this will raise awareness for uh, the physicians out there that you know, didn't have uh, any information about LPA and, you know, you can't blame them because, well, uh, it, it's obviously in the guidelines, but, you know, not all physicians read all the lipids guidelines. There's so many guidelines out there that uh, you can't blame them for that. But I mean, that's why we have to do more education to, uh, to physicians.